Now, you might think that this episode is a little hysterical on my part, because the subject today, while hiding in plain sight in the Constitution, has been essentially unimaginable since it was first conceived. Something called a convention of states. But bear with me, because you need to hear this. We have turned the, the Constitution of the United States into, instead of a charter of liberty and a and a document designed to limit the power of government to its delegated powers, we have turned the Constitution into essentially a bill that allows government to do anything except for these few specific areas where we say you're kind of not allowed to do that. It's a complete reversal of what government was supposed to be. And that is why a convention of states is so necessary. That's Ben Shapiro speaking remotely to a gathering of advocates in support of the Convention of States movement a while back. Hopefully, they gave you enough chills to settle in and eavesdrop on a scenario that was once considered a long shot and now has a mathematical chance to actually happen, maybe within the next decade. And if you're thinking, oh, a decade is a lot, remember that a decade ago, gay marriage wasn't legal, Twitter hadn't gone public, and Trump was still a reality TV star. And few people imagined that Roe v. Wade would be struck down, that the EPA would be gutted, and that states would be banning drag shows and books. It's time to start imagining the unimaginable. UNFTR. Let's start with the issue at hand, this critical section from Article 5 of the Constitution. Quote, The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call for a convention proposing amendments, which, in either case, shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states. End quote. Article 5 of the Constitution outlines the ways in which the Constitution can be amended. Now, the operative word here is outlines. And while there's consensus on the existing amendments, there are disagreements among scholars about the viability of certain paths. The first line says that two-thirds of both houses can propose amendments. This is how every successful amendment thus far has been proposed. The first 10, which we know as the Bill of Rights, were ratified together in 1791. Since then, only 17 additional amendments have been ratified, with one of them, the 21st, repealing another, the 18th. If you're wondering how rare it is to accomplish this, there have been more than 11,000 proposed amendments in our nation's history. So the second line of the article strikes at the heart of the matter today, and that's the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states shall call for a convention proposing amendments. This is the convention of states. So if two-thirds of the now 50 states propose an amendment, it must officially be considered for inclusion in the Constitution. It gets tricky here, and we'll visit this more in a minute, but should an amendment be proposed by two-thirds of the states, which is 34, then it must be adopted by three-quarters of the state legislatures, which is 38. Translation, the states can bypass Congress altogether to ratify a constitutional amendment. There are several procedural questions that arise when contemplating this particular journey. Does it all have to happen at once? Meaning, do the states have to convene to propose an amendment? or series of amendments during a convention? Or can they ratify amendments one by one in state legislatures, then call a convention to try and get three quarters of the states to jump on board? In the latter scenario, which is the one being pursued by the way, if a state passes an amendment in 2023 and then attempts to overturn it after a convention has been called, is the original one invalidated? Assuming this kind of scenario, the validity of a convention, regardless of what was proposed or ultimately ratified, would undoubtedly face a challenge at the Supreme Court at some juncture. And given the generational composition of what can only be called the Trump Supreme Court today, do you trust that outcome? Considering the originalism by convenience leanings of the court, I would have to cast serious doubts on this. It should be mentioned that there is a final passage in Article 5 where the framers specifically allude to the parts of the Constitution that cannot be touched. It bans the importing of humans for the purpose of enslavement, prevents states from taxing one another, and does not allow the two senators per state formula to be altered. Everything else is on the table. The implication behind a convention of states is a no confidence in the federal government, that the federal government is either too big or too powerful and no longer represents the will of the people. 
So the framers, Madison in particular, gave the states a way to check this power and put whatever the issue is back in the box. So until now, most of the emphasis within the movement has revolved around government spending. Although we'll speak the quiet parts out loud in a bit, let's just focus on that. As for the who is behind this, there's a real movement. There's an organization that is well-funded and has, for decades, been pushing for a convention of states focused on limiting the spending authority of the federal government. That's right. The primary rationale used by conservative proponents of the convention process is to restrain the federal government with a balanced budget amendment. By constitutionally forcing the government not to run deficits, conservatives would be able to achieve a whole host of reforms. Using today's figures and assuming an amendment like this actually came to fruition, the government would have to cut trillions in spending, basically the projected amount of the deficit at any given time, this year and every year going forward. The entire country would be forced into a do-over. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, you name it, everything would be slashed and burned in pursuit of a balanced budget. And before you say, hey, that's nuts, who would want to do that? The answer is very, very clear. Conservatives do. This is their backdoor concept to stripping away all of the spending that matters to our daily lives. Before we even open our imaginations to explore all of the social possibilities from an outright ban on abortion or contraception, codifying onerous voting laws that disenfranchise millions, or other horrific possibilities, recognize just how much of the United States at present would simply disappear overnight with a balanced budget amendment. The madness of states actually ratifying something like this would seem absurd, given that state aid for schools, budget gaps, healthcare, roads, etc., would all be cut as well. But apparently, that doesn't bother the Republican-controlled legislatures of 19 states who have already passed legislation calling for a convention of states. Yes, this is happening. And while the likelihood of obtaining a two-thirds majority is slim today, and three-quarters of states ratifying something so radical is even more slim, we can't turn a blind eye to the fact that 19 states have already seen fit to take this first step. As we've said so many times before, when it comes to interpreting the Constitution, to interpret the intent of the founders, we don't need to struggle. They literally left behind their study notes in the form of the Federalist Papers. So before we go through a mathematical exercise to determine what advocates of a convention of states need in order to secure an actual compact, let's hear from a couple of our founders to hear what they had to say about this process. There are only a handful of references to the amendment process in their papers, but they are indeed insightful. The bulk of the writing was done by James Madison, and this first passage is a reflection of the debate surrounding federalism, essentially how much power should be maintained by a central authority versus the states. Now, most modern conservatives, I would say, are states' rights advocates at heart, seeking to limit the authority of the federal government, which was just as rich of a debate back then as it is now. Anyway, here's Madison from Federalist 39. Quote, if we try the Constitution by its last relation to the authority by which amendments are to be made, we find it neither wholly national nor wholly federal. Were it wholly national, the supreme and ultimate authority would reside in the majority of the people of the Union, and this authority would be competent at all times, like that of a majority of every national society to alter or abolish its established government. Were it wholly federal, on the other hand, the concurrence of each state in the Union would be essential to every alteration that would be binding on all. The mode provided by the plan of the convention is not founded on either of these principles. The proposed Constitution, therefore, even when tested by the rules laid down by its antagonists, is, in strictness, neither a national nor a federal constitution, but a composition of both." End quote. So in this passage, as in much of his writing, we see Madison working out the issue of states' rights in real time. With respect to a convention of states, he's walking a fine line between nationalism and federalism and ensuring that the high bar of two-thirds for proposing and three-quarters for ratifying prevents absolute power to either interest. He further codifies this in Federalist 43, saying, quote, to have required the unanimous ratification of the 13 states would have subjected the essential interests of the whole to the caprice or corruption of a single member. It would have marked a want of foresight in the convention, which our own experience would have rendered inexcusable. So those are the procedural protections that inform 
the convention process, though it tells us little about what kind of propositions would rise to this level. On this, Hamilton actually offers a little more insight, which we'll get to in a minute. But Madison does remark further in Federalist 43 that, quote, the rights of humanity must in all cases be duly and mutually respected, whilst considerations of a common interest and, above all, the remembrance of the endearing scenes which are past and the anticipation of a speedy triumph over the obstacles to reunion will, it is hoped, not urge in vain moderation on one side and prudence on the other. End quote. It's clear that Madison is pressing for cooler heads to prevail, and that any amendments be, at their core, moral. That's about as didactic as Madison gets, by the way. Hamilton, on the other hand, far more flowery and high-minded in speaking to a convention of states, begins the following sentiment in Federalist 85 by quoting David Hume. Quote, to balance a large state or society, whether monarchical or republican, on general laws, is a work of so great difficulty that no human genius, however comprehensive, is able, by the mere dint of reason and reflection, to effect it. The judgments of many must unite in the work. Experience must guide their labor. Time must bring it to perfection. And the feeling of inconveniences must correct the mistakes which they inevitably fall into in their first trials and experiments." End quote. Then Hamilton, in his own words, continues, quote, these judicious reflections contain a lesson of moderation to all the sincere lovers of the Union, and ought to put them upon their guard against hazarding anarchy, civil war, a perpetual alienation of the states from each other, and perhaps the military despotism of a victorious demagogue in the pursuit of what they are not likely to obtain, but from time and experience, end quote. Before we unpack that a little, just prior to quoting Hume, he offers a personal sentiment in Federalist 85, which is, quote, for my own part, I acknowledge that any amendments which may, upon mature consideration, be thought useful will be applicable to the organization of the government, end quote. So what's hanging over these guys when they committed all of this to writing and, of course, in assembling the Constitution itself is the issue of slavery. In many ways, the sentiments behind the procedural aspects of the Constitution were acknowledgments of America's Achilles heel. And while it's not for us to pursue today, there are so many scenarios contained within the procedural elements that they established and the sentiments therein that speak to the tortured process of trying to create a nation with morals while protecting an institution as evil as slavery. But for our purposes today, we have to examine not only the amendment process, but the current push toward it. And by the way, no matter what you hear in the future about this issue, you have just heard every single word and everything written about it from the perspective of the founders. So anything else that surrounds this is pure conjecture. It's interpretation and it's entirely subjective. To be as objective and clear as possible, I think it's reasonable to extract the following two sentiments from Article 5 itself and the Federalist Papers passages that speak to it. First, as Hamilton mentions, any amendment should relate to the organization of the government. Now, in my mind, that excludes moral clauses like abortion, prohibition, racial issues, anything like that. Essentially, any hot-button topic surrounding identity politics in this day and age. Second, as we hear from Madison, it should be really hard to do and reflect the will of the majority. So let's use that as our baseline. Let's look at the movement in front of us and do a little math. Now it's time for us to be leaders among leaders. We're going to save our nation. Exercising our rights as states under the Constitution in an Article 5 convention. This is what we have to do. You have proven that the people of the United States are ready to hold the first Article 5 convention in the history of this country. That it's a far greater risk for us to do nothing. Clearly, we can do this. Probably our last best hope of preserving liberty for the next generation. Freedom is what's at stake. Self-government and freedom are the outcomes when you have limited power. So the clip you just saw is from an actual dry run of a convention of states. Representatives from all over the country gathered in 2016 to test Article 5 and hold a theoretical convention. A couple of things. They did it first because there's never been an attempt to hold a convention. So the organizing group behind it, a well-funded group called the Convention of States Action, wanted to create the blueprint. Second, it was really expensive to produce. Before we look at the gains that they've made, let's look at who's behind it. 
For starters, their biggest endorsements come from a who's who of terrible people. Conservative talk show host Mark Levin, Ben Shapiro, Sean Hannity, Rand Paul, Sarah Palin, Ron Johnson, and Charlie Kirk. And then you have this guy who gets the hidden power of state legislatures. The thing, though, that I'm encouraged about, Steve, is if you go in the country, if you go in the individual states, I actually think there is a widespread belief in the reforms you discuss and I've discussed. And one way to do it would be doing it through those state legislatures because the dysfunction in Washington is not good for our individual state governments either. Not to be outdone, there's also this guy. Hi, I'm Texas Governor Greg Abbott. And I want to thank each of you for what you're doing in the Convention of States movement. I know from our experience here in Texas what it takes to pass a Convention of States resolution in each state. It takes dedicated activists like you to show up and make sure that your voices are heard. I mean, this movement literally has support from the worst people in the country. A reason in and of itself to be afraid. But what's more troubling is what Abbott said. He knows what it takes to pass a COS resolution because Texas was one of the 19 states that made it happen. So it's math time. Okay, so let's start with the 19. Georgia, Alaska, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, Indiana, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arizona, North Dakota, Texas, Missouri, Arkansas, Utah, Mississippi, Wisconsin, Nebraska, West Virginia, and South Carolina. In terms of the effort already underway, let's look at the states and groupings. We have states that I'll call on the cusp. These are states where legislation calling for a COS has already passed one chamber and where the party has control of both state houses and the governor's office and a convention of states active lobby. So as of right now, this group includes Iowa, South Dakota, and New Hampshire. And that brings us to 22. Then there's a grouping of states that I'll call primed. These are states where Republicans are in control and have an active lobby, but no legislation has passed yet. Ohio and Wyoming have both chambers, the governor's office, and an active campaign. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Kansas, and Kentucky have at least two positions of control and an active lobby. And Montana and Idaho have all three, but no active lobby as of yet. But as prime states are in Republican control, they're in a position to be swayed. So all in, that's another eight states. That puts us at 30. Troubling, but still shy of the two thirds needed. Now over to the states that are up for grabs. These are the ones that kind of blow in the wind. So the question is whether there are four more to be found in these five states. In Minnesota, you have a divided legislature, but an inactive lobby, but always a precarious red-blue dynamic. Same thing in Maryland. On the other hand, you have New Mexico, which already passed legislation in one house. Then you have Virginia and North Carolina, also precarious red-blue states that have divided houses, but one that has already passed legislation. If you pick off a Maryland, Virginia, New Mexico, and North Carolina, and add them to our primed states, you have enough to call a convention. So what about the faithfully blue states? Well, that's where hope lives. The blue wall that is New York, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Illinois, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Hawaii, and Colorado. These reliably blue states with Democratic chambers and a theoretical bulwark against the red tide that would be required to get a three-quarter majority for ratification of any amendment. Or plainly, that gets us to 38 states. But let me ask you something. How confident are you that all these states will hold over the next decade? Colorado and Nevada were red states as recent as 2004. Delaware, New Jersey, Maine, Vermont, and California went for George Bush Sr. At this moment, do you have a sense that the country is moving to the left or to the right? If you want to examine the math yourself, we actually built a cool little color-coded map on our website. So just go to unftr.com slash COS to see how we group the states. In terms of what a real convention would look like, because the framers never actually specified procedural aspects of it, there are more questions than answers. But one has to imagine that the questions would be answered not by the best political process, but by the biggest wallet. Believe it or not, there's big money behind this movement already. 
The Convention of States Action Organization raises almost $7 million a year from dark money sources. Mark Meckler, the head of the organization and co-founder of the Tea Party Patriots, is a Gold Circle member of the Council for National Policy, a secret right-wing Christian nationalist organization. Meckler has been quoted saying that, quote, Black Lives Matter as an organization is evil. It is anti-American. It is anti-nuclear family. They say this on their website. It's pro-transgender. It's a mental illness, by the way. You can't be pro-mental illness. It's a terrible thing, end quote. Good Lord. And while the Convention of States action itself doesn't disclose its funders, Sourcewatch uncovered a few that tie back to the Mercer family, Koch brothers and groups funded by Leonard Leo, the dude who hand-selected Justices Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Do I have your attention yet? So again, this might seem really fantastical, really far off, but the point is they've been working at this for a very long time. So if you'll notice in the last election cycle in the midterms, they didn't do all that well at the congressional level. And they don't do all that well at the executive level with all the woke nonsense that they put forward. But you know where it works? At the local level. You see, the more they distract us at the top with the big stuff, the easier it is for them to do the work at the bottom. It's one of the reasons that I am not in favor, as I've said before, of third party efforts, because all that does is dilute the power at the state and local level. The more parties you have, the more representation that you have chipping away at the Democratic side, the more the conservatives and Republicans are able to build a coalition in lockstep to take over state legislatures. So take a look at the Convention of States movement if you really want to understand what they're going after, because in one fell swoop, a convention of states to get a constitutional amendment passed to require the government to balance its budget will absolutely wipe out all of the social services and entitlements and New Deal funding that we've had. We would go back to a pre-Keynesian reality where we had to balance these budgets and a lot of the really good things that we have today would wind up on the chopping block because do you really think that they're going to cut the military spending in order to balance the budget? Of course not. So this is subterfuge. This is the ultimate Trojan horse. And we have to pay attention to things like this in order to keep our eyes on the prize. And the prize, in my opinion, is to infect the Democratic Party with progressive ideals, do a hostile takeover from the inside out, and not dilute the parties at the state level. Because if you do, this is what you get. And here endeth the lesson. <laughs>